Hello, my name is Karina Cabrita and I'm a product manager at Cytognos. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our invited speaker, Paulo Tavares, which will present to you the importance of monitoring circulating plasma cells in routine diagnostics in multiple myeloma. Paula has obtained a bachelor's degree in industrial chemistry in Colombia and a doctoral degree in natural sciences in Germany. From 2012 to 2017, Paula worked as a researcher at the group of Professor Dr. Thomas Hunick at the University of Würzburg. In 2018, she joined the research group of Dr. Andreas Beidhack, where she established full cytometer-based MRD and CTPC. In her current research, she investigates the phenotypic profile of cancer cells, immune cells, and cells of the tumor microenvironment in patients with multiple myeloma and solid cancers, utilizing next-generation flow cytometry. Welcome, Paula, and thank you for being here today. Thanks a lot for the very nice introduction, and thank you for the invitation to this webinar. I will talk about monitoring of circulating plasma cells in routine diagnostics in multiple myeloma. The core picture um, is showing the beautiful city of Woodsburg, where our university hospital and our diagnostic unit are located. Uh, a little bit about us. So here you see the Department of Medicine. This is our uh, research institute where our diagnostic center is located. And we are just five minutes walking distance to the um, Department of Medicine. Uh, we are one of the biggest multiple myeloma centers in Europe. Uh, we treat around 800 multiple myeloma patients per year. Woodsboro is also the lead center for the DSMM study. This is a big study in Germany that focuses on the development of new therapeutic um, approaches in multiple myeloma. Our diagnostic unit um, was created in, 2000, in 2019. Uh, we established first the method to evaluate measurable residual disease, MRT, which was formerly called minimal residual disease. And later on, we established the method to evaluate circulating tumor plasma cells in multiple myeloma. Uh, here you see Professor Andreas Beilhack. He is the principal investigator of our uh, research group. The re research group is already running for around 10 years. And this is uh, Maria and this is Amy. They are the lab, um, the, um, the technical assistants who process all the samples we receive for diagnostics. We also have some research projects. Uh, Matteo and Carla are medical students involved in the project studying the circulating endothelial cells as biomarkers in cardiovascular conditions in multiple myeloma patients. We also have projects um, where we study GMA as a prognostic marker in multiple myeloma. We are also interested on developing methods to study the immunoprofile of um, cancer patients. And we also have interest on learning about regulatory T cell activation markers in multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is a hematological malignancy characterized by the infiltration of monoclonal plasma cells in the bone marrow. The plasma cells uh, represent the final stage of maturation of B cells. So the maturation of B cells happens in the bone marrow, then they migrate to the secondary lymphoid, uh, lymph nodes where the antigens are presented to B cells, then the stimulated B cell give rise to antibody secreted plasma cells, and the plasma cells migrate then to the bone marrow and differentiate into long-lived plasma cells. In normal conditions, plasma cells produce polyclonal immunoglobulins to fight infections, but when we have plasma cells that are abnormally proliferating and or producing uh, big amounts of immunoglobulins, then we have multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma accounts for around 1% of all cancers and 10% of all hematological malignancies. People diagnosed with uh, multiple myeloma are uh, between 60 and 70 years old. And unfortunately, multiple myeloma is not a curable disease. But uh, due to the recent to the development in the last in the recent years, uh, the imp there is an improvement in the overall survival from two to three years to eight to ten years. 
Multiple myeloma is a multi-step process with different uh, precursor phases as IMGAS, uh, smoldering multiple myeloma, and um, multiple myeloma can also progress to bone marrow independent uh, diseases such as extramedullary disease and plasma cell leukemia. Um, the, <clears throat> the International Myeloma Working Group uh, proposed some criteria in order to characterize um, each stage of the disease. For example, uh, this is uh, considering the levels of the M protein in serum, the percentages of plasma cells in bone marrow, and also some other parameters that are grouped um, <clears throat> and called MDE, which is the myeloma defining events and includes, for example, if the patient has anemia, renal failure, etc., etc. Just to show you how complex is multiple myeloma, I would like to share these uh, images with you. These are from patients uh, in our center. And <clears throat> what one would expect is that multiple myeloma is a disease homogeneously distributed in the body. But what you can see here is that there are some focal lesions um, which show us that uh, the disease is behaving more or less like a solid tumor. This is happening in many patients and this makes a little bit complicated the diagnosis because, for example, in the case of MRD, uh, we cannot assure always that uh, we will have uh, tumor plasma cells in the location where we take the aspirate. So this makes the, the whole landscape a little bit more complex. There are different methods um, already established in the, in the <clears throat> clinical routine to diagnose and monitor multiple myeloma uh, patients. Um, there are some tests in blood and urine where we can see, for example, the levels, the levels of the immunoglobulins. We can also see the chemistry profile in blood uh, where we can see the beta-2 microglobulin level. We can also see the blood counts and so on. But these methods in blood are not so, sensi as not as, uh, so sensitive. Mm, then we have the um, bone marrow testing that involves uh, bone marrow aspiration, of course, and this is an invasive method, which is not so comfortable for the patient, but it's giving us very good information. So uh, with the bone marrow aspiration, we can assess, uh, for example, the plasma cell morphology. We can, see, we can evaluate the um, percentages of uh, plasma cells in the bone marrow. We can also see the um, chromosomal abnormalities uh, and so on. And here of a special interest uh, are NGF and NGS, which are highly sensitive uh, techniques right now that are being utilized um, in the monitoring and diagnosis in multiple myeloma. NGF is ne a next generation flow cytometry, and, the, and this is what I'm going to talk about today, uh, about um, <clears throat> assessing um, circulating plasma cells uh, by using next generation flow. Um, also, next generation sequencing is a highly sensitive technique, um, now also established and standardized. Um, and also to complement this uh, bone marrow and blood testing, we have the functional imaging studies, um, which also bring complementary information to what we have, to what we have so far. Uh, but uh, these imaging studies are also not as sensitive as MRT, as uh, NGF or NGS, and some of them are invasive because there is the, they need some radiation. Here you can see an example of the uh, plasma cells in healthy volunteers. So in the left, we have a, a sample uh, from, a, from bone marrow from a healthy donor. And here we see the typical phenotype, the phenotype of plasma cells. So they are C138 positive, C38 positive. They are polyclonal, um, they are C56 negative. And here in the right, we have the, um, an example of plasma cells um, from peripheral blood from a healthy volunteer. Uh, the phenotype is also similar to the phenotype in the bone marrow, but there is one, one key difference is, and is that the C138 expression in, in peripheral blood plasma cells is uh, negative for most of the, of the plasma cells. 
Some years ago, the Euroflow group um, standardized um, the evaluation, uh, standardized a method to evaluate MRT in multiple myeloma. This is very nice because this is how flow cytometry got standardized. And this process is um, very well established from the moment of the sample collection to the moment of the data analysis and reporting. Uh, what they did was to um, establish a um, uh, method where they measured two, in two different tubes, 10 parameters um, to see the, to evaluate if the, the frequencies of abnormal plasma cells in a bone marrow sample. So here are an example of this. These are the plasma cells, the abnormal plasma cells are here in red and the normal plasma cells are here in blue. The, you see here the, the um, uh, abnormal phenotypes. So these cells are C45 negative. They are C38 lower than, they are positive, but lower than the normal plasma cells. Then they are C19 negative, C81 negative, and they are lambda restricted. So here we can see that, that these, are the, uh, these are abnormal plasma cells. And then, so the, the MRD uh, method in, uh, in bone marrow is already very well established and is used by many centers in the world. But so far, there are no clear guidelines about what to do with the MRD result. So in some cases, people are doing earlier controls or people are doing more chemotherapy, for example, when a patient has an MRD positive. But it is not, there are not, real, not really clear guidelines about what to do with this result. So this would be a good moment to incorporate this into the, into the clinical routine and, and also have some standard um, guidelines to follow. And also there is a lot of evidence um, generated in the recent years where, the, where, where it's shown that the MRD negativity is asso associated with longer survival rates. So here I have some example of this. So just to mention one, here you can see, for example, in, the, um, in this blue line, um, these patients had MRD, uh, were MRD negative, and these patients had also longer survival rates. And yeah, in the other examples, we have the same. Here is the MRD negative. Here we have the MRD negative samples, same here. Mm, about our MRD um, in, our, in our center, um, this is an example of a sample of a, a real case in our hands. And you see here the, the abnormal phenotype of the plasma cells. So they are C38 a little bit lower than the, normal, than the expression of C38 on the normal plasma cells. They are C45 negative. They are kappa restricted, C56 positive, C117 positive, and C81 and C19 negative, which is a very typical phenotype of abnormal plasma cells. Until now, we have processed around, we have processed 171 bone marrow samples from multiple myeloma patients. And here, a small data analysis we did so far. So we took um, the data from 75 patients who already um, reach uh, VGPR or CR, complete remission or stringent complete uh, remission. And uh, from this group, 22 patients uh, reach ne uh, MRD negativity. And then we look at the, um, at the patients who have um, functional imaging results. 52 of them had imaging uh, results, and then we compare. So we have that 61 of the patients had, um, were MRD positive, but negative by imaging. And this is very nice because we could detect with MRT what it was not detected with imaging. But then we have two patients where MRT were, was negative and imaging positive. So this is a little bit of what I was showing you before that sometimes uh, maybe the location where we take the bone marrow aspiration is not the location where the disease is uh, progressing. So that's why we need a combination of all these methods to, to have a, a, a better um, overview of the disease.
very nicely also the MRD negativity was a shift in 30% of the patients suffering from high risk disease and also in late treatment lines. Okay, so now um, we have heard about uh, plasma cells in bone marrow, but what about plasma cells in the blood, in the periphery? So the Euroflow uh, group also developed some um, couple of years ago this method. They established this method and standardized the method to evaluate um, circulating plasma cells in peripheral blood. Um, the method is very similar to MRT. And uh, what they show here in, recent, uh, in a recent publication is that um, plasma cells are detectable in 100% of the patients with smoldering multiple myeloma and multiple myeloma at the moment of diagnosis. And then after, um, and, then, and here is just to show you the, the, um, the numbers. So this is the CTPCs per microliter of peripheral blood. And then we can see that the multiple myeloma patients have more um, frequencies of, of CTPCs than smoldering multiple myeloma and MGAS and so on, which one would expect. Mm, recent observations have also um, led to the conclusion that uh, CTPC has a prognostic impact on multiple myeloma. And here in the left, we see the, that patients that were um, that uh, were tested at the moment of the diagnosis and had less than 0.1 CTPCs per microliter in peripheral blood had longer survival rates than patients uh, with, with higher uh, amounts of CTPCs in blood. And here in the right, we see that patients that kept a CTPC negativity over time also had a longer survival rates, which is indicating that CTPC has a prognostic um, impact. Here, just want to, I just want to compare the different techniques we can use in blood to evaluate plasma cells, uh, tumor plasma cells in blood. And so these three here are the most sensitive ones. So NGF, also qPCR, and NGS. And the advantage of uh, next generation flow cytometry is, so first of all, um, is a is highly available. Um, is a highly available technique. Um, it doesn't require um, baseline a baseline sam baseline sample, so we don't need to have a, a measurement before therapy. So this can be measured at any time point, and it's also a technique that in three or four hours we can already have a result. Um, of course, the other two techniques we have are also highly sensitive, but they are or more expensive or more time consuming. So NGF is a, is a very good approach to follow to evaluate plasma cells in the, in the periphery. So here are some advantages of a monitoring of um, circulating tumor cells by NGF. So NGF is a highly sensitive method for the detection and quantification of plasma cells in blood. Um, the detection of, of um, abnormal plasma cells uh, by NGF is a minimally invasive method for the monitoring of multiple myeloma after uh, therapy. The presence and number of uh, circulating tumor plasma cells have diagnostic and prognostic implications uh, in the different stages of the disease. And it also provides information independent and complementary to the bone marrow MRD. Now I will show you a little bit of the technical part uh, regarding the processing and how to measure the sample and how to set up the instrument, how to compensate, and then how to analyze and report the, um, the data. So we normally receive the peripheral blood from the patients who come uh, for a routine um, uh, control uh, to the clinic. <clears throat> so this, this blood sample is normally processed on the same day. When we get a sample in the late afternoon, then it's processed the following day in the morning. But in, uh, for this test, we need to work with fresh, with re fresh, um, with a fresh sample, no longer than 36 hours. 
um, before processing. Um, so we normally receive the sample, then we do a license and we do a staining. Uh, these lyses and staining steps are really very nicely established by Euroflow and we follow these guidelines uh, point to point and it's very clear and it's working very nicely. So here we have two different antibody cocktails, so we, have, we will have two tubes. Um, what is very important is that we reach at the end of the analysis that we can acquire with the instrument uh, from the two tubes, we acquire in total at least 10 million cells because uh, otherwise we don't reach the sensitivity that uh, we can reach and we are supposed to reach with the, with the NGF technique. So for this, I mean, depending on uh, how the operator uh, is during the processing, if you, you can start, you might start with 20 million cells before lysis and then end up with uh, 10 million cells um, acquired, recorded events um, in the moment of the, of the measurement in the fax. In our case, we start to make sure we reach the sensitivity. We, we start with uh, a little bit more, but uh, this is still fine. At lo as long as we have uh, the right amount of viable cells, uh, we can reach the sensitivity sensitivity we, we want. Um, so we have two tubes and then we put a, we stain every tube with a different antibody cocktail. So the tube one will have the general markers for multiple myeloma including CD117 and CD81 and in tube two we will have uh, the, general, the same general markers and uh, kappa and lambda um, which is a centris, uh, intracellular staining and uh, this kappa and lambda we use of course to see the, the restriction um, if the plasma cells are kappa or lambda restricted. So after the, the sample is uh, processed we acquire in the instrument um, we should use an um, um, intermediate speed in order not to get so many doublets and um, uh, during the measurement. And then after the measurement uh, in the instrument, then we have our FCS file, so our uh, file to be exported and analyzed in the in the software. So we export the two FCS files, from uh, one from tube one, one from tube two. Then these two files are merged in the software Infinisight, which is the software I use for the, uh, for the analysis and for reporting of the sample. And, uh, but there is, um, this uh, software has a very nice tool and is, uh, um, you can run this sample uh, through the database and then the software does an automatic gate, gate and identification. And then it's, it tells you already which are B cells, which are T cells, which are neutrophiles, uh, monocytes, and it also uh, gives you a suggestion which are abnormal plasma cells. Of course, after the database uh, runs, um, the person doing the analysis should check and go through the populations and see if the analysis was properly done. Normally it's really, really accurate. There are sometimes some minor adjustments need to be done, but this is this works very nice and it's very um, safe in a lot of time that one doesn't have to do this assignment of the cell populations manually. But at the end, what we need to see here are the percentages of abnormal and normal plasma cells. And this I really look in detail, of course, um, and then I do the assignment of the abnormal plasma cells, let's say manually. But um, yeah, the, at this point, the database already, uh, the software did already part of the work, uh, which is very nice. So then I prepare a report, which I later send to the clinicians, and then the clinician will, of course, discuss the result with the patient. So here to go more into detail in this part, um, to, to set up the instrument and also later compensate, we need first to set up the forward scatter and the side scatter parameters. For this, we need, to, we need uh, 50 microliters of blood from a healthy volunteer. We will do a, um, a fast lysis and then just measuring the facts. Uh, make a gate on the lymphocytes and then adjust the voltages of the forward scatter and side scatter to certain 
targets. These targets are the MFI, which were established by Euroflow. So this is instrument dependent. And um, these targets, these values I got from Cytognos. So they, these values are specific for the instrument I have. So depending on the instrument, uh, we need to adjust to certain targets, but these targets are normally provided by Euroflow or Cytognos. So when I know already the forward scatter and the side scatter parameters, I take then some calibration bits and these calibration bits have different populations. Here I'm using already the forward scatter and the side scatter values I adjusted before. And then I have different population here. And then I take the population number five. I, get, I make a gate here. And then I adjust the voltages in every channel according to the targets Euroflow established. In this case, I don't have, uh, so I got these targets from Cytognos, uh, but I don't have exactly the same configuration in my instrument um, than Cytognos has. So in this case, I had to adjust a little bit to my own instrument, but I mean, this I could manage after some runs and then, and this is working uh, very, very nicely. Uh, in this case, was uh, these are the channels of uh, Kappa and Lambda. RL1, RL3, red laser 1, red laser 3. And, <clears throat> and I mean, these are the targets I, I ended up with. And uh, after adjusting, adjusting my voltages to these targets, then I can compensate using these voltages. But this works different to uh, what we, uh, to the way how we normally compensate. Normally we just adjust the voltages and, and, and or we do a, um, a voltration to find the optimal voltage. But here, this is already done by Euroflow. So here we just get the targets and they tell us which targets are the best values where we can adjust to, to which we, we can adjust our voltages to have the, the optimal voltages and the optimal um, settings of the instrument. Then we run um, a compensation. This is now running a, as this is just a normal compensation. Uh, we have to compensate both tubes separately. So we have tube one here. Here we have the general markers, as I mentioned before. So we have C138 in both tubes, CD27, C38, CD45, CD56, and CD19. And for tube one, we have C117 and C81. And for tube two, we have uh, kappa and lambda. Kappa and lambda are intracellular, intracellularly stained. This is a normal compensation. Here we see the positive and the negative, and the negative uh, peaks for the compensation. And um, the compensation I normally do with bits, but this um, uh, this is uh, one can use just uh, normal commercial uh, bits. And um, here we have the matrix just to see the spillover values. And then we see that there are no um, really high spillover values that show that the compensation. Um, so here we see that the compensation is, pro is properly done. And normally when we have already the voltages adjusted to the targets that are recommended by Euroflow, then the compensation should, should work right away. Okay, then uh, here I will just show you a summarize of uh, how the database, how the software works, but I will show you now uh, next in detail how this works. So um, the software does, um, it, when, they, when we run a sample through the database, then the software does an assignment of the, of the different cell populations by automated, automated gating and identification tool. Um, it does an assignment of abnormal and, and normal plasma cells, uh, but this more, <laughs> in my opinion, is more like a suggestion, but this is uh, very precise and very nice uh, because then you are really looking to a very small population in, here and you don't have to go through all the populations to look for your plasma cells. And um, there is something that is called checks. Um, and these checks are the populations that the software could not assign. 
because maybe they don't have so uh, such a clear uh, phenotype. And then these populations normally uh, one can assign uh, manually, but uh, normally these uh, checks are um, uh, not so not so many. And then after this, we, I prepared the report. The software has um, an, uh, let's, uh, an automatic report uh, uh, tool, which is very nice. And I'm using now is saving really, really a lot of time instead of doing a manual reporting and copy and paste and writing a lot. This is already like a, a saving a template in the software, which I can use every time I need to report. So this is very nice. To run the database, we need to open the InfiniSight software. Then we click here on databases. And then we just need to drag and drop the FCS files. Uh, these are the FCS files from the measurements in the fax instrument. So they were exported. And here we have the FCS files from tube one and tube two. We just drag and drop to, the, um, to this um, window. And then here we see the analysis, the parameters um, which were measured during the analysis. We say OK. And then in this case, this is a CTPC sample. So we select peripheral blood. And then we see here the option for CTPC. In the case, in the case we have an MRD sample, then we would need to select bone marrow. And then here would appear MRD. Uh, but in this case, we click here on CTPC. Then the, Two samples are loaded already. We see again here the parameters and here we see the population tree. So if I want to run the database, I just say OK and then the database start running. Um, but in this case, I will not do it in order to save time. I did this uh, already in advanced. Then I will show you uh, how it works. I will go um, directly to, to show you uh, how uh, to do the analysis of the samples. After running the database, this is what you will see. So here uh, we have in different colors the different populations that were already identified by InfiniSight. And here uh, we have the um, viable cells and you see here the population tree where we can see every individual population. You can check on individually on them. Uh, for example, we see here the, um, the cells that the software identified as normal plasma cells. And you can see here that the phenotype uh, corresponds to the phenotype of the of normal plasma cells. And then we have our populations. You can we can simply click on all of them or on each of them as we want. In the case we want to check um, that the phenotype is right for all the populations, uh, or without, um, there is uh, maybe one population that doesn't look so um, so right. So this is uh, we can check one by one and and then see if the assignment is uh, properly done. But this is normally very accurate. So normally uh, there is no, no need for adjustments here except for the tablets, but this we will do at the end. And uh, what I uh, what we do here now is to go uh, through the check populations here. So the check populations are the populations that the software did not assign, um, but um, it does give us some suggestions of what they are. So we have, uh, for example, here the case of the and um, so as I clicked here on the um, question mark, I see the um, uh, this black population is the population that is here under the, the this um, in this location, and um, then I want to compare them with the monocytes that were already assigned. This is an easy way to, to see if the phenotype is right. And then we see, OK, yes, these cells were properly assigned. And we can say, OK, these cells are monocytes. Then I, ch I will check the B cells. So we have here the lambda positive B cells. We look at the phenotype. If it's right, they are C19 positive, they are C45 positive, C139 38 negative, C38 intermediate. And we see there are some doublets, but this we will um, 
assigned later to the doublet population, but to me they are a lambda positive mature B cells, and then I just assign them here. Same for the kappa a mature B cells, I will just assign them here. And then we have some B cells that were in the tube one that's why we see them here in the um, in the plots where we are looking at c117 and c81 this is the the um, tube one and then we don't see any black population here because uh, here we don't have kappa or lambda staining and then we see we look at the phenotype they look right uh, we have just some cells that are tablets which are this here in the in this plot but this we will this, this will we will clean up later uh, so for now we assigned as b cells and then um, we go to the normal plasma cells and here we have the lambda positive plasma cells which are um, have the phenotype of the normal pcs and we have here so they are c38 positive they are have they have a heterogeneous expression of c138 which is pretty common on on plasma cells in the periphery and the um, phenotype of the plasma cells in blood is normally a very heterogeneous is um, like a, in many cases we have for example a negative expression of c100 117 um, we see heterogeneous expression of c81 and this is this is very common in the in the plasma cells in the periphery so these cells look to me like they are normal plasma cells lambda positive i will assign them as lambda positive plasma cells then i will check uh, this population which are the kappa positive pcs we have the same phenotype we had just with the lambda positive pcs and we assign them as normal uh, plasma cells then we have here our plasma cells that were in tube uh, one that's why we see them in these plots here they have the normal phenotype uh, of normal plasma cells then we assign them as normal plasma cells and now we go to the um, abnormal uh, population and this is the suggestion the software is giving me and it's showing me also immediately the normal plasma cells so I can compare. Uh, we can also look at them um, just at the, at the abnormal plasma cells. So uh, I see here there is a clear population which is C56 positive, is C38 positive, 45 negative. Uh, is kappa restricted so these cells really look like they are abnormal plasma cells so i will just assign them as abnormal plasma cells and then um, these cells here they look like they are debris so i will just assign it as a debris and here um, i completed the assignment of my populations so now i want to display only the normal and the abnormal plasma cells to see how they look um, and then we can see here clearly they are two different populations and here in this plot uh, this is the um, automatic population separation and this is really nice here you can really see uh, also that the populations are different and this is uh, this plot is made based on the on all the parameters uh, that were used um, to measure the sample so this is very useful um, during the analysis um, okay uh, now we need to um, assign the doublet so I will and then I will make my plot bigger I can also make it here that the um, that the populations are displayed a little bit smaller so this is and then here I can I can just make a date and then I can say okay these are tablets and then I can assign them to the tablet population. The software also calculates the percentages of debris um, of events out of scale. Very nice tool from the software. But now I will prepare my report, so I will just display the normal and the abnormal plasma cells because this is what I show in the plots of my reports. 
I will just um, open here um, to get my report and this is a template that I generated uh, previously so I know I did this template once and then I can use it every time I do an analysis and this is very nice this is saving me a lot of time and it's also uh, not giving giving so much room for mistakes uh, so this is um, I'm usually using this in, in in my routine and in my daily routine and um, so in the in the report we have already the percentages of the populations we want to report so the percentages of uh, b cells uh, t cells eosinophiles uh, we have here the percentage of normal plasma cells and the percentage of abnormal plasma cells that were identified during the analysis and here uh, I have also the um, a number of recorded events and uh, here you can see the um, limit of detection which is calculated uh, based on the number of viable cells that we acquired and then here I only need to fill up the name of the patient, the date of birth and the um, date of the measurement and um, and I like also to type the phenotype on my own so I check that the, the phenotype is right we have kappa restricted uh, plasma cells and then my report is ready and I can simply save as and then uh, this will save um, a PDF and this PDF I can send to the to the to the clinicians I will show you now um, an, an example of a, of a report um, these are from real cases in our diagnostic unit of course I don't show the patient information here patient name and date of birth uh, but here so here I would write the, the information about the patient the name the CTPC ID number the date of birth and the in and the date of the measurement here we have what I just show you the percentages of the different populations and this was a negative uh, CTPC report so here we have zero for um, the amount of uh, abnormal plasma cells and here in the right we have an example of a positive CTPC report this is the one we just uh, generated uh, with Infinicide uh, so I sent the, the PDF to the clinicians and then the clinicians uh, meet the patient and uh, discuss the results with the patient. We started with the CTPC um, diagnostics in May 2020. So this is um, we started with this few months ago. Until now, we have processed 131 samples, where uh, from where 122 samples um, had a number of required of uh, acquired events uh, during measurement of 10 million. Uh, at least 10 million events were acquired and in terms of num number of viable cells we could acquire in 114 samples at least 8 million events these numbers are important in order to calculate the sensitivity and in 70 samples um, corresponding to 53 percent we reached a sensitivity of 10 to the minus 6 and in 61 samples corresponding to 47 percent we achieved a sensitivity of 10 to the minus 5. Uh, here I have some preliminary data of uh, the samples we have so far. I just wanted to correlate it a little bit with other methods um, that were used uh, to monitor the patient at around the time where the CTPC testing was done. And here in the left, um, in these figures, I'm comparing the CTPC testing with uh, serum immunofixation, with histopathology, with imaging, and with MRD results. And then here, um, so for the serum immunofixation, uh, histopathology, and imaging, we observe more or less, more or less the same the same behavior so we see that we have uh, in some patients we have CTPC positivity 
and uh, but in, at the same time we have some serum immunofixation negative results and then we all we have the opposite uh, situation as well so we have some ctpc negativity but at the same time uh, there are some C uh, serum immunofixation positive results we see the same situation when we compare ctpc with the histopathology and with the imaging results but when we look at mrt there are not a ctpc positive um, uh, results on uh, patients with uh, mrt negative results which is what we would have expected uh, considering that the that multiple myeloma is a disease uh, where the plasma cells are infiltrated in the bone marrow and also considering the the sensitivity of mrt this is expected but and also what it was very very interesting here is that um, i took here a group of 18 um, sample so these are 18 patients who were who had ctpc positivity and uh, all of these patients had a uh, serum immunofixation and imaging results so we have some positive uh, some negative among the ctpc positive uh, samples but what is interesting here is that we have some we have nine patients that were positive with ctpc method but um, had negativity when looking at serum immunofixation and imaging so this is telling us that ctpc is a technique that is coming to complement the other methods we have available uh, right now for the monitoring of in multiple myeloma especially the methods um, which are low sensitive and also the non-invasive methods so to complement the serum immunofixation for example the imaging um, methods and um, and we know also from the literature is giving us additional prognostic information so ctpc is a very powerful tool um, that should be incorporated into the clinical routine to give us a bigger spectrum in the monitoring landscape in multiple myeloma And now some conclusions from my talk. Um, so we know already that MRT and CTPC are a very, very sensitive methods uh, that are very useful um, in the diagnosis. Um, they will help during the disease staging. They will also give, a, give us information at the cell le level of the light chain restriction. Um, these methods are also very useful uh, during the monitoring of disease progression and um, it gives us they uh, they give us a uh, prognostic information that will help the clinicians to decide for a therapy according to the characteristics of the patients um, in the bone marrow uh, we can use ngf to detect and quantify plasma uh, tumor plasma cells and evaluate uh, therapy efficacy um, mrt negativity is also associated with better overall survival rates and um, regarding the detection of plasma cells in the periphery um, this is a method that is non-invasive and is also helping in the early evaluation of treatment efficacy and as i mentioned before it will come to complement the other uh, testing uh, possibilities we have currently in multiple myeloma so here are my final remarks from this from this uh, webinar and so MRD and CTPC testing by NGF, they, uh, they, are very, um, they are very sensitive and powerful tools that uh, need to be incorporated into the clinical routine. Of course, this is for the benefit of the patient, which is the main goal uh, for all of us. And the CTPC and MRD methods can also be incorporated in clinical trials, um, which will help to follow up therapy efficacy and also to determine the um, endpoint uh, of the treatments. 
I would like to thank my colleagues um, in our research group and my special thanks go to Professor Beilhack for his full support during these last two years uh, where we, while we were building up this diagnostic unit. Also to Maria and Amy for the hard work with processing the samples, documenting and establishing all regarding doc, um, diagnostics. Uh, I would like also to thank our collaborators in the Uniclinic of, uh, of Woodsburg. Um, we established a very nice and dynamic cooperation with them, and this is working very nice. And I also want to thank Professor Herman for providing the um, bone marrow sample from a um, healthy volunteer. I want to thank Cytognos for this very nice invitation and also for the um, uh, support and guidance during this time of, of the uh, establishment of these protocols. I would like to thank also the entities who are giving us financial support. And of course, thanks uh, for listening. Thanks for your attention and for the time. And I will be very happy to answer your questions. And in the case there is no time to, to answer all the questions, feel free to contact me, send me an email. Uh, if there is something that was not clear, something that you, something extra you want to know about this topic, feel free to contact me. Thanks a lot.